what David has in store for us tonight. Psalm 119, verses 89 through 96, but starting with verse 89. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Now the word fixed is in the sense of a settled matter. A settled matter. In fact, if you look at the King James Version or uh, the New King James Version, it will even say that, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven forever or something along that nature. And so uh, it's fixed in the sense that uh, if we look up at the sky at night and we look to where the North Star, Polaris, is, we know that that is a fixed point in the sky. And I believe that if you could stand there long enough and the earth would sit still long enough, you'd see that all the stars of the Big Dipper kind of revolve around that one North Star. It remains fixed. It's settled. It's there. It doesn't move. Everything else it moves in conjunction with or around that one star. And what David is saying is that God's word is like that. God's word is fixed in heaven. So everything, everything in creation, everything in this universe moves around that one fixed point of God's word. God's word is what it is. And it will never change. It is firmly fixed in the heavens. So. As we look at it, David tells us that the universe is an example of God's established word. The universe, because just like that North Star, it's there. And the order that we see around it, the order that we see in the universe, everything is there. Everything was made by God, or really by Christ and for Christ, and through Him it all continues to exist until that final word when he says it's finished, then it'll be over. But we understand things in that way. God's word's established. It's established this universe, and because of the order of this universe, we can understand the orderly nature of God's word. Look at verses 90 and 91. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth, and it stands fast. There it is. We live on it. We trust that it's going to be here. Now, we, we understand one of these days it's going to be gone. But it's going to be God's choice, not man's choice. It's not going to wear out. But when God decides it's over, it's over. By your appointment, they stand this day, for all things are your servants. Everything here it is God's servants. And Again, the order that is established, the way things work together, is a testimony of God and God's creation of an orderly universe, a cosmos. It's not chaotic. Uh, you might have seen in the news not too long ago, uh, like maybe last week, that there was some sort of a a comet or a meteor or something that was the size of the Empire State Building or a huge building that came close to the Earth. Kind of scary, right? But you know, it's thousands of miles away, but that, oh, it's coming close to the Earth. You know, well, they're, they're still worried about something hitting the Earth. Well, if it does, you know, it's because God wants it to. God's established it that way. God created the universe and put, it in, put into effect the laws of creation. We like to call them the laws of nature, right? But really they're the laws of creation. They're what God created this universe. Let me go back and say, since last week we dealt with, uh, or two weeks ago we dealt with the book of Job, about how that God created this world, this universe, based upon wisdom, not justice. It's the wisdom. Everything out there is the wisdom of God, and that's the orderliness of this universe. That's God's laws of creation, because he put them there to run 
everything on a timely schedule and you think about how nature works, kind reproduces after its kind. What happens if kind doesn't really produce after its kind? What happens if there's a mutation? What happens in the next generation? Either there is no next generation or it reverts back to what it happened, what it was before. It just doesn't progress. Mutations don't. And that's what the Bible tells us in, uh, in, in Genesis chapter 1. Kind brings forth after its kind. Dogs don't bring forth cats. Apes don't bring forth human beings. It just doesn't happen that way. Seasons come at their respective times. Now, now, again, we like to think, well, but you know, the summers are getting longer and the winters are getting longer and spring and fall are getting shorter and this and that. No, 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 no. Seasons are all about 90 days. Because seasons are determined by where the sun is and where the earth is in relation to the sun. And, uh, what the, and where the equator is, so to speak. So, you know, it, it doesn't matter about the weather. It doesn't matter about the climate. It's about where is the sun that's passing the equator. Very simple to understand. Now, seed time and harvest, that remains about the same, though, doesn't it? Because you plant in the spring and you harvest in the fall. Unless you're planting winter wheat, you know, and that can't, seems kind of strange. You plant it in the fall and you reap it in the spring. But that's an anomaly, isn't it? That's something that's, that's unusual. But yet, it goes by plant. It goes by how it's designed. Now, did God design it? Or is that something that man has uh, technologically advanced to, to do that? Yeah, man has a, a lot to do with, with hybrids and things of that nature. But yet still, the purpose is there. The order is there. You know how it's going to react. Well, what would happen if certain laws of nature suddenly ceased to be laws of nature? What if gravity just decided it was going to work today? Would they go? <laughs> That'd be the end of Well, we wouldn't have a cosmos, would we? We'd have a chaos. Everything would be in chaos if, if the laws of gravity no longer apply. So God has put into effect not only laws of creation, not only what we call the laws of nature, God has put into effect spiritual laws. And we talked about that in the book of Proverbs today. There are spiritual laws that stand behind all of those Proverbs that say, hey, here's the wisdom of God that it's put forth. That if we do this, we'll live lives that are peaceable, we'll live lives that are prosperous, we won't be fools, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, have, we'll walk in wisdom, and we'll have good lives. Well, faith, David says, your faithfulness endures, as he's talking about God there in that passage that we just read. Uh, verse 90, your faithfulness endures to all generations. Look. If gravity's been here and has worked the same since the day of creation, do you think that God's spiritual laws have worked since that time also? That they've been in place since that time also? Yes. And that they will endure until the end time also? Until Jesus says, hey, it's finished. It's over. I've come to take my children home. I've come for judgment. Well, sure. So, <clears throat> keeping these laws brings order and peace into our lives, these spiritual laws. Breaking these laws brings what? Chaos and suffering. 
pay off the stuff. Is it that simple? Is it, is it just that simple? Yes, it is. Now, we can't help what the people in the world are doing. We can't help what other people are doing. But what we have to do is, is live by God's principles ourselves, by His spiritual laws, so that, so that we don't, and even though the world be in, in chaos, we can be like that on the, that rock in the middle of a raging stream. Okay? And there's just chaos all around us, but there we are. We're standing firm on that rock that we don't have to worry about. It. Though everything around us is falling apart, God's spiritual laws are eternal and will never become obsolete. You know, they're going to go on for eternity because when we pass into the eternal kingdom, uh, that's going to be all good. Those spiritual laws are not only going to apply, they are going to be lived out by us when we get there on a day-to-day -day basis because there's not going to be any evil there. Remember what I told you about evil this morning? What is it? It's a parasite. Evil could dwell in heaven, right? Because there's so much good there that God's not going to allow it. He allows it to sit, they exist here because this is where we're tested. But he's not going to allow evil in the heaven. Now, once we get there, we don't have to worry about it, right? There's not going to be any temptation. Just, I don't know how that works. But won't it be wonderful there? That's what the song says, right? Just because there's no temptation to sin there. God's spiritual laws rule the children of God by choice, not by force. God is standing there with a gun telling us, you better do this or I'm going to kill you. It's a choice. Jesus said, and we talked about it this morning, I believe, or no, we're going to talk about it here in just a moment. Okay, well, let's talk about it now. Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Choice, choice, right? And learn from me, for I'm meek and lowly in spirit, and you shall find rest for your soul. Yeah. That's what we need for rest, isn't it? get tired of fighting sometimes. Get tired of fighting with the devil. Get tired of fighting with temptation. Get tired of fighting with sin. Yeah, but sometimes we give in when we get tired. But, but, won't it be wonderful that we don't have to put, some, <coughs> put up a fight all the time once we get over on the other side? So God's spiritual laws are eternal. Never become obsolete. Now, David tells us that without hope, without the hope that God gives us in His Word, the cares of this world would destroy us. Destroy us. Now, what does that mean? Spiritually. It would spiritually destroy. Think of that. If you didn't have hope, if you didn't know anything about God, if you didn't know anything about what Christ has done, what would your life be like? You'd be like just everybody else out there in the world. You'd be like everybody else out there that, that even though God is known, the ones that don't know God, the ones who are walking in darkness, we'd be walking in darkness with them. Yeah. And that, therefore, we would be destroyed. Listen to what David says, verses 92 and 93. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. Without God's word, we have no hope of eternal life. If we have no hope of eternal life, what kind of a life are we going to have here? What would be the use of existing? Right? Why go through it if there's no hope of eternal life? Well, well, that's what faith's about, right? 
God's word gives us hope, but that, that's what produces the faith. By faith, we know that there's something better than this world, something better than the existence that we have here in this world. So in Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a, there you go, rewarder of those who, what? Seek him. He rewards those who seek him. Are we seeking God? Are we seeking God? Are we seeking God? Or are we seeking heaven? Are we seeking God or are we just seeking some blessings? Are we seeking God or are we just seeking forgiveness? Is there a difference? Is there a difference? Is there a difference? Am I seeking God or am I seeking something that I want from God? I can't get what I want from God if I don't have God. Right. But, see where I'm, where I'm going? And, and it, it's, a, it's crucial that we understand that point because that's where David's going to. That's where David's going to in this. All right? Am I seeking God or am I seeking the things that God can bless me with? Am I seeking God or am I seeking the blessings? If I'm seeking God, I get the blessings. But if I'm seeking the blessings, you know what? I just yeah, might miss the blessings and God. Romans 10, 17, so faith comes by hearing and hearing through the Word of God. God's Word has to be the rule of our lives. Now, and, and that includes everything. That, that's in our speech, that's in our behavior. God's Word is the rule of our life. That's where we go to. When we experience the abundant life, we want more of it. See, we can throw John 10, 10 in there. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. How could I have a greater life than what I've got right now? <laughs> have God in it. Have God be number one in it. Have Christ be preeminent in it. That's how, because that's that guarantee of eternal life. That, that's the hope for the future. Now, a closer walk with Jesus makes life more fulfilling. Again, I come they may have life and have it more abundantly. Oh, how does he do that? Then we talked about it this morning, didn't we? John 8, 31, 32. And he said to the Jews who believed in him, if you continue my word, then are you my disciples indeed. If you continue in my word, if you abide in my word, some translations say, and that's what the English Standard says, if you live in my word, then are you my disciples truly, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Free. It's a beautiful word. Salvation is giving God the opportunity to save us. What? God can do anything! Right? God can do anything. God can't sin. God can't lie. There's some things God can't do. Now look at this next set of verses, 94, 95. And I told you this is going to become important, okay? Are we seeking God or are we seeking the blessing? I am yours. Save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked lie and wait to destroy me, but I consider your testimonies. <clears throat> so how does this connect? Why is this important? We have to remember, God is just as bound by His Word as we are. God has said He will not save us apart from faith and obedience. I know there are a lot of people out there who say, You 
<laughs> you haven't got any choice in the matter. You know what philosophers call that, right? Blow me. I used to say bean soup. Okay. Blow me. All right. And there are some say, no, oh, all you have to do is believe. If you just believe, if you just have faith, that's all you got to do. And that's as much baloney as the other because what good James, look at what James says. Faith without works is dead. Where does a dead faith get you? Faith perhaps not works is dead. But God is just as bound by His Word as we are. He's not going to change His mind when it comes to Judgment Day. Here's what I told you I need for you to do so that I can save you. You didn't do it. You didn't give me the chance to save you. Can you imagine God crying on Judgment Day for all the people that He has to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You didn't give me the chance to keep my word, to trust it, to obey it. So, listen. Listen again. I am yours. Save me. It's not, save me. I'm yours. It's, I'm yours. Save me. There's a commitment that's been made. God, I'm yours. I've got nowhere else to go, save me. The other's like, save me, and then I'll be yours. No. We're gods, whether we realize it or not. We're just either in submission to him or we're in rebellion to him. It's better that we be in submission to him by believing and obeying his word. Think of the people on the day of Pentecost, all right? Uh, the, these are people. The people that were there probably 50 days earlier that were saying, crucify him, crucify him, right? And then, you know what happened when they crucified him? There's darkness come over the face of the earth from noon to three o'clock in the daytime. Not clouds. Darkness. There was an earthquake. And the earthquake shook so hard. The temple, in the temple, the, the curtain, huge, big, tall curtain ripped in two from the top to the bottom. And they saw it in the temple. The tombs, the rocks were split open, but the tombs opened up, and bodies of Old Testament saints arose from the dead and went into town. And I don't know how many days they were in there talking to those people in town. They saw these things. And 50 days later on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, they hear the sound of a rushing wind. They kind of gather there uh, around the temple. What's going on? And here come the apostles, and they got these little flames <laughs> on their head. Can you imagine that? It's like, oh. And they're speaking in different languages so everybody can understand what's being said. What's their first response? They're drunk. They're, dr they're full of new wine. They're drunk. Oh, it's Pentecost. It's a religious festival. That's what people do. They get drunk. Yeah, that's why God destroyed them. No. This is fulfillment of the promise. This is what God has set in order. Jesus 
of Nazareth. A man attested to by God, by his good works, and by fulfillment of scriptures, proved that he is the son of David, and that he is the Christ. And you took him, and you hung him on a cross. You crucified him, and you know it. And listen to this, starting with verse 37 in Acts chapter 2. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. For you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, even are everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Well, he calls, but the answer is faith and obedience. That's the answer. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. <laughs> once again, once again, please, please. And I don't know why the translators do this. I don't know why they do it. The correct out of the Greek is be saved. It, 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 it's not an active. It's, it's inactive. It's, it's passive. It's not active. It's passive. You trust and you obey. You trust what has just been told, you've been told to do. You obey it. You repent, you baptize in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins to not to save yourselves, but to be saved. You put yourself in the position. You give Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the opportunity to save you. David's talking about even way back there a thousand years before Christ even came to this earth. <coughs> but here's the thing. It's just not wanting to be saved. It's first of all putting ourselves in submission to the will of God. I am yours. Save me. If you save me, I'll be yours. No, I'm yours. I'm yours. Save me. Now look what happens. Verse 41. So those who received his word, and the King James, remember what the King James says? Those who gladly received his word were baptized and were added that day about 3,000 souls added to the apostles. Added, I believe, to the 120 that were in the upper room. Added to all those faithful who had been baptized under John's baptism. Set to the kingdom of God. But set. Because they said, I knew it. Psalm 119, verse 96. Now, I, I, I chose to read this out of the Amplified Bible. Have you ever read from the Amplified Bible? It's, in, it's interesting. It gives you some insights maybe that you, you don't see. Now, remember, uh, these insights are, uh, are like commentary. Okay? But listen to this. Okay, Read along, follow along in your Bibles, but listen to this. I have seen that everything human has its limits and no end, no matter how extensive, noble, and excellent. But your commandment is exceedingly broad and extends without limits into eternity. I like that. Now, again, that's a human being's interpretation of some of the things, you know, to, to put context there. 
But you know, that sounds like verse 89, forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Yeah. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Matthew 16, 19, Jesus told his apostles, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And once again, Look, it's because it was bound in heaven that they're going to bind it on earth. It's what God has fixed in heaven. That's what they bind here. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven because it was loose there. What is God's will in heaven has been brought to earth. So God's word is fixed. The matter is settled. We must submit to its instruction, its instructions in order for us to adhere to so there you have it. That section, I, I like that little section there. That's, that's a gem. That, that's a gem right there. So, hey, thank you for your time and your attention. If you have a need, please let your request be made known as we stand and sing.